In the shadowy and enigmatic realms of Quake 1 and 2, a vital force breathes life into these iconic games. Light. This subtle yet powerful element transforms the virtual landscape, adding depth and atmosphere to every corner of these pioneering first-person shooters. Today's journey takes us through the intricate process of lighting pre-calculations in Quake and Quake 2. We'll also cast our spotlight on the latest advancements in lightmap compilers brought to life by the passionate Quake community. So get ready to illuminate the shadows as we delve into the breathtaking brilliance of lighting in Quake 1 and 2. As with other aspects of Quake's design, Quake's lighting model exploits pre-calculation to take the load off the end user's machine. In this case, a so-called light map is built for each level. These light maps were pre-calculated during game development and shipped with the compiled map on the retail CD. A light map is a cache of how much each point of a surface is illuminated. In Quake, it's a bit like a second texture applied to almost all the faces in a level. Each such face has its own small grayscale light map image. This image is 2D, so naturally we need a way of mapping 3D points on the surface onto 2D points of the texture. This is done with an affine transformation, defined by the artist when aligning the texture. This type of transformation means that whenever you shift the points in 3D space by a fixed amount, the corresponding point in 2D also shifts by a fixed, but different amount. This type of texture mapping can be encoded with just a couple of vectors. These texture coordinates are used both for addressing the light map and the texture. In the case of the texture, the coordinates directly correspond with the horizontal and vertical image coordinates, except with wrapping occurring when the texture coordinates go outside of the image bounds. The light map differs in two ways. Firstly, it is scaled down 16 times in each dimension relative to the texture. For each light map pixel, or luxel, there are 16 by 16 texture pixels, or texels. Secondly, the light map does not wrap. This means the light map must be made large enough to contain the entire surface. To prove the point about texture scaling, we can scale each texture image by two and reduce the texture scale in the map source by a half. A short compile later and we get double light map resolution. Of course, the compiled map is much larger and requires more memory at runtime. Plus there are some weird side effects, but that's a topic for another video. As the map is compiled, the lighting stage calculates bounds on the texture coordinates of each face, which correspond with the edges of the face's light map image. This is done by iterating the vertices of a face and mapping them onto the texture coordinates via the linear transformation. With these bounds, we can work out how big the light map needs to be to cover the entire face. Conversely, we can work out which texture coordinates correspond with the edges of the image. It's worth noting that this scheme is not perfect. If the face is not rectangular, or it does not align with the texture coordinate axes, then there will be some pixels in the light map that don't get used. But it is simple and turns out to be good enough in Quake's case. Knowing both the texture coordinate transformation and the bounds of the light map, we can freely map between points in the light map and points in 3D space. Enough about texture coordinates. To light the world, we must have a light source. In Quake, lights are placed by the artist. These are point lights, which means the light emanates from an infinitesimal point rather than from an area as with any real world light. While not realistic, it makes calculating occlusion a lot easier. For each face, a 3D target point is generated corresponding with the center of each luxel. Each light target pair is iterated. If the path between the light and the target is blocked, then the pixel receives no contribution from the light source. The method for calculating this mutual visibility uses the BSP tree and is similar to that used for doing point traces at runtime. Check out my video on this topic for more details. If the light is not blocked, the exact contribution is calculated according to linear falloff, which makes the illumination dimmer with distance. Another term reduces the contribution when the light hits the surface at a shallower angle. Each light is processed in turn and the total contribution is accumulated in the face's light map. For efficiency, lights that are too far from the face to make any contribution are skipped. This scheme is simple but has its downsides. The occlusion is binary for each pixel, which results in harsh jaggies on shadow edges. To fix this, the compiler has a setting to enable anti-aliasing, 
which produces four samples per luxel and then averages the result. This gives nicer edges, but naturally takes longer, so for a test build, mappers might disable anti-aliasing. This low resolution light map looks crude as it is, but at runtime Quake linearly filters the image. This not only hides the blockiness, but works quite well for shadows as it suggests a softer shadow edge, like you'd get with a real area light. There is one final trick that the light compiler employs. Near concave edges, sample points can actually fall behind other parts of the map geometry. Naturally, these points are in shadow, which can lead to darkening on edges since pixels that are visible end up having a contribution from these occluded samples due to the linear filtering. The compiler fixes this by shifting any sample points that cannot see the face's centre towards the centre. As groundbreaking as this was, over the years technology has improved. In August 1996, only two months after Quake's release, John Carmack had a working light compiler based on radiosity. This is a method for lighting that produces bounced light. The surface that is directly lit by a light source itself becomes a source of light, and so on. This gives a more realistic illumination without the need for the artist to place extra secondary light sources to light up areas which would otherwise be lit by bounced light. The radiosity lighter was used in Quake 2, released in 1997. Combined with coloured lighting, this gives a much more lifelike impression of how light propagates. Imagine the simplest thing you could do to implement bounced lighting. If you completely disregard speed, you might, after calculating direct light via the Quake 1 method, add a new light for every texel. The light's brightness would be proportional to how much it is lit directly, which can be read from the first step's light map. You could then redo the tracing for each of these new lights and update the light map to get an approximation of one step of bounced light. Repeat this for more bounces. Of course, this is horribly slow. For each bounce, in the worst case, you end up tracing from every texel to every other texel. Even using the PVS data structure to prune out invisible faces, the computational cost of doing the visibility tracing is simply too high. The Quake 2 light compiler, QRAD3, uses a two-pronged approach to make this problem tractable. First of all, it doesn't sample per texel for bounced light. Rather, it splits each face into subfaces, called patches. Each patch is about 64 by 64 units in size, which is larger than the 16 by 16 lighting texels. This means that there are far fewer patch-to-patch -patch visibility traces to perform. Secondly, patch visibility is pre-calculated and stored in a so-called transfer function. The transfer function describes how the power leaving each patch is distributed to the other patches that it can see. Patches further away receive less power in accordance with the inverse square law, as do patches with a smaller area and those at a steeper angle. Of course, occluded patches receive no power at all. We want this transfer to conserve energy, so the total power transferred is normalised to 1. Pre-calculating the transfer function avoids repeating calculations since typically each patch will be encountered many times as the compiler progresses. Let's walk through an example. Consider compiling this simple scene. QRAD3 does an initial pass that is very similar to the Quake light compiler, with direct light being accumulated in a light map. The light map is then transferred to the patches as a single scalar per patch. This number represents the total power coming directly from light sources. You'll notice that the power shown here isn't quite even. This is because some patches are smaller and so naturally receive less power. Let's instead show power per unit area, but bear in mind the calculations are really in terms of power. The incoming power is multiplied by the surface colour to get the outgoing power. All the energy hitting the black walls is absorbed and the cube reflects only green. The outgoing power is then distributed via the transfer function to get the incoming power for all light that has bounced once. The green light from the cube is thrown onto the floor, and the white light from the floor is cast up onto the cube. This process of alternately shooting and reflecting repeats for 8 iterations, after which the power being transferred has almost all been absorbed. If we repeat this loop you can see the light bouncing between the cube and the floor. On each iteration, the incoming power after the initial bounce is accumulated. This contribution from bounced light is interpolated and added into the light map, 
which is multiplied by the surface colour in engine. The result isn't perfect. You can see a mottled effect near the edge of each cube's face. This is a bug in the interpolation code. However, in the retail Quake 2 maps, it doesn't seem to be too big of a problem. After fixing the bug, the cube example looks a lot smoother, but there is plenty of scope for improvement. Since 1996, the Quake community has developed both the engine and the map compiler, bringing, among many other things, improved lighting methods into Quake. Nowadays, if you're making a Quake 1 map, you're likely to be using Eric Wasilition and Parrell's Eric W tools to build your level. This toolchain bakes bounced lighting, coloured lighting, bong shading, ambient occlusion, area lights, and more, straight into the light map. Eric W Tools performs radiosity in a different way to QRAD3. After each bounce, it treats each face as a fake light, whose brightness and colour are integrated from the light map on the previous bounce. The light from these fake lights is accumulated on a per luxal basis in a similar way to the initial pass. Whereas QRAD3 calculates transport from patch to patch, Eric W Tools effectively calculates transport from face to luxal. This means the light source on each bounce is cruder, but the destination is at full light map resolution. This gives a nicer looking result while keeping memory and CPU usage manageable, at least on modern systems. Still, at higher quality settings, multiple point lights will be generated per face to simulate an area source. How then does Eric W Tools do this in a sensible time? Well, 25 years of hardware improvement certainly helps, but the light compiler further boosts speed by replacing the bespoke BSP tracing routine with calls into Embry. Embry is a ray tracing library produced by Intel. It is optimized for modern CPUs and uses efficient data structures to enable faster tracing through polygon meshes. While Eric W Tools was primarily written for Quake 1, through the efforts of Eric and Parallel, Quake 2 support has since been added. Parallel ultimately ended up being contracted by id to work on the recent Quake 2 re-release, which used Eric W tools to recompile the original maps, bringing all its enhancements to a new audience. Alongside the Quake 2 developments, the mapping community for the original Quake is still thriving, in no small part due to the much improved tooling that is now available. I'll leave you with some shots of incredible Quake 1 maps that the community has produced, and their underlying light maps. <laughs>